Hey everyone, welcome back to The Lookout. Today we're going to talk some more about the Dixie Fire. We're going to look at the area west of Chester and talk about um, how it burned, which was hot for the most part. And um, going to look at some of the forest management there, um, talk about lessons that we're learning about um, how fires burn under extreme conditions. Um, I want to point out that this conversation, like any good conversation about forestry, it's really rooted in a single place. We're talking about the area west of Chester. Uh, the Dixie Fire burned with a, a wide range of effects over you know, almost a million acres. So there's lots of different things that were happening at different times on the fire. We're just going to talk about this area just outside of Chester. It doesn't really mean you know, that the same thing was happening in other places of the fire. Any place that we're going to talk about um, fire behavior and how fire and forestry intersect, we should always have those conversations based on a really specific place, just because things are so variable across the woods. Anyway, um, we're going to use some satellite imagery here and look at um, the way the fire burned. If you have questions about this, um, any of this stuff, just put them in the comments here. I want to thank our sponsor of this episode, which is Paul Components. They make bike parts here in Chico and uh, been really involved with the um, show building up in Plumas County and a uh, big time supporter of supporting recreation and uh, local economy in Plumas County. So thanks, Paul. Hope you enjoy the video. So this story starts with some really wild weather. We had a big storm front blow through on the 5th of August and the days preceding it, we had some strong winds out of the south that blew the fire up to the north. And then when the front passed, as you can see here, it just blew the fire hard out to the east. So we're gonna look at how this big weather event affected fire behavior in the area west of Chester. And we're gonna use some technical tools to look at what the forest conditions were like in this area before they burned, and if they had any effect on the severity of the fire. I wanna share this website. This is the California Forest Observatory website put together by Salo Sciences. And it's a great tool for looking at kind of big picture what the conditions are like in the forests. There's a bunch of different layers here that describe you know, canopy cover, which is kind of the density of the trees, uh, canopy height, and other things like canopy base height, which describes how far off the ground the first sets of branches are. So um, we use this in our work looking at fire behavior potential. And there's a couple interesting things that pop out here. One of them is that you can see areas that have been intensively managed. Um, the canopy cover is a lot lower, in places that have been thinned heavily. Um, there's some roadless areas here on National Forest land that have, haven't been logged in a long time. And you can see just how dense those are. You can see where there's clear cuts, where there's really no canopy. You can see along Highway 36 where there's been major fuel brake thinning done. And also heavy thinning along Highway 36 over north of Clear Creek and over to Westwood. And another place we're going to look on this is up north of Westwood on Highway 821 where there's been heavy thinning for the last 30 years on the flat lands along A21. A lot of this thinning really bought firefighters some major advantages during the firefight. For example, along A21, having a large thinned area directly adjacent to the highway made it a lot easier for firefighters to light and hold backfires that stopped this entire flank of the fire from spreading farther east. Given the critical nature of the fuel conditions during this time, it's highly unlikely that firefighters would have been able to stop the fire here without this thinning. But in many other areas of the Dixie Fire, there appears to be little relationship between the condition of the forest before the fire and the fire behavior and severity that we observed. So let's take a look at patterns and severity of how the fire burned across the landscape. Another thing that is pretty interesting that we can get out of satellite imagery is fire severity. And basically what we're doing here is we're taking infrared information after the fire burns and we're looking at what's left of the canopy. And then this hot pink map here, basically where it's hot pink and red, really not much survived the fire. It's a lot of black sticks, black stick forest. And you no, know, down here at the bottom of the map is Black Forest Lodge coming across Highway 36 over to Chester. And a lot of you have probably driven this now and just seen uh, just how bad this is. And that was part of this run of the fire that ran, you know, over 100,000 acres in two days. The fire took off and crossed Highway 36 and it ran here, threatened Chester, burned up into Lassen Park. 
appeared by Juniper Lake. So we're on the road to Warner Valley near High Bridge, and this just really got roasted. Even the bigger trees along here, a lot of them are, are not going to make it. So I thought it'd be interesting just to look a little at, you know, how some of our assumptions we've had in the past about thinning, you know, management history, logging history. Does any of that show any relationship to the fire severity we got? So this is a good area to kind of explore that and that we've had a, a really wide range of forest management history around Chester. You know, we've got private lands here. We've got, um, you know, Forest Service land. So in this image, this green line is, this is all Forest Service managed lands. Uh, we've got Collins Pine land in here that was managed in one way. We've got SPI land out here that's managed in another. And what we see is that the Dixie Fire really was kind of an equal opportunity destroyer here. It, it kind of ripped across this landscape without a whole lot of regard. It's not like the lands that had been more intensively managed in the last 30 years necessarily fared better. Uh, I just want to throw up here, this is our um, our map showing areas that have less than 50% canopy closure, right? So we talked about how when we do thinning, we we like to aim to have, you know, oftentimes less than 50% canopy closure. And that we've thought a lot in the past that this really helped with fire resilience. So if you look at here, this um, canopy closure less than 50%, so you can see that most of those areas still smoked in the fire. Interesting thing here is that the fire, um, as it blasted north as a head fire, it was really severe. And as it kind of backed and flanked on the edges, kind of perpendicular to the wind direction, it was lower severity. And then some, we were able to you know, use dozers and put out a lot of this line. Also up here towards um, Willow Lake, you know, here's Warner Valley. As the fire moved with a flanking spread, this area all burned in the fire but a lot of it burned with a lower Apache severity. So not all fire spread is, is equal also. You know, fires that spread under really intense weather conditions, winds, uh, tend to be a lot more destructive. And then the same fire a few days later, it might, in exact same fuels and exact same topography with less wind, it might just kind of back slowly into the wind. Um, it might flank to the sides and underburn. So when that happens, then areas that had, had more thinning you know, that would buy you some advantage. Over here, there's these areas out by Swain Mountain, north of Westwood, where we had um, majority of the canopy was was closed canopy. A lot of these areas, there's more than 50% canopy closure. These were areas we'd maybe consider thickets or overstocked before the fire. And a lot of those didn't burn uh, once the fire was no longer driven by high wind. So there's a lot of subtlety to it. You can't say like, well, thinning doesn't work. You know, there's um, there's... A few folks right now, they're saying, hey, look, these big fire runs are proof that thinning is a bad idea or that it doesn't work and we shouldn't be thinking that thinning is going to prevent us from losing these lands in a big fire. There's elements of that that are true. You know, as you know, clearly shown here in this land, it's had a ton of thinning and still every tree is killed. When we've got severe drought and high winds and hot weather, there's nothing we can do to stop fires from doing this type of behavior. But when we don't have these extreme conditions, thinning does help. And it's also provides us an opportunity to do things like prescribed burning. So it's one of those tools we have that um, we need to keep using. And we have to be careful in these conversations. There's nothing absolute. Thinning's never always right. Thinning's never always wrong. There's times when it doesn't work. Here's another metric from the, um, the satellite imagery, which is the tree height. It shows that the average tree height is less than 70 feet. Historically, this land was covered with huge trees. Maybe there weren't any branches for the first 40 or 50 feet. That made it a lot harder for a crown fire to run. One, it was hard for the fire to get up in the like crowns. And two, even when you had stand conditions that might support active fire on the understory, it was less likely to kill the large trees. You know, I think after fires, we spend a lot of time looking at like, what can we do here? Are we going to salvage log all this land and replant? Obviously, a lot of that's going to happen on private timber lands. But the nature of where we have mills in this country and the people that own them, the people that own the mills also tend to have their own land base. 
Collins Pine and SPI, Sierra Pacific Industries, just took huge losses in this fire. They've taken huge losses over the previous years. A lot of the land in this whole region has had big fires in the last three years. So there's a huge backlog of logs that need to be milled um, that belong to the private companies. So at this point, the Forest Service could be giving logs away and the mills don't need them or even necessarily want them. So that just means that we're going to have a lot of land out here that doesn't get salvaged log. There's going to be a lot of snag forest. There's going to be a lot of brush. That's just going to be part of the reality moving forward. The economics of it are that no one's going to build a new massive sawmill soon enough to harvest all the logs from the Dixie fire. So when we talk about how to move forward, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that these places on the map that are still green, either that didn't burn in the Dixie fire or that burned with lower severity, these are some of the only forests we have left right now. If we stay in drought conditions, it's not unlikely we'll have more Dixie fires. And so before we run out and try to plant millions of trees and cut a bunch of brush and snags down, uh, we should consider what's the likelihood that new forests that we plant on public lands will even ever survive to be old enough to cut to harvest for timber. I think what a lot of the private landowners are learning is that you know, trying to grow a product that takes 80 years to grow in a place where you could have an intense fire anytime is tough map. And so we really need to be thinking about how we can prioritize forest management to protect communities like Chester, like Westwood, Clear Creek, Peninsula, so we don't burn them up. And we need to be looking at how do we get fire back on the landscape in these places that have had fire now and are more resilient to it. A lot of this land here in the burn is green, just got a nice underburn. And these are places where we can maybe reintroduce some natural fire on a to keep it this way so we aren't gonna lose what's left in future fires. The Forest Service is currently scoping places to do roadside salvage logging and hazard reduction within 300 feet of existing roads in the Dixie Fire. And given their extremely limited capacity to do non-fire work, I think it's really important that we take time right now to scope out the places to work that have the greatest tactical value for controlling future wildfires or managing wildfires for resource benefit. There's a lot of controversy around salvage logging for a lot of good reasons. But as the person who works in the woods, it's important that we maintain safe access to manage these lands, especially if we want to try to put fire on the ground for resource benefit in the future. The people that are going to have to control those fires and do the work in the woods, friends of mine, are going to be a lot safer if we do some work now to remove hazard trees. In general, I think it's extremely unlikely that the Forest Service is going to do large-scale salvage logging anywhere that's not within 300 feet of a road. Anyway, these are some you know difficult conversations. They're really complex. The Lookout's going to keep feeding you some of this kind of information. If you like this stuff, share it with your friends. If you want to keep supporting the Lookout so we can keep doing this kind of stuff, consider making a subscription donation on our PayPal. Even 5 or 10 bucks a month it really helps us have a little revenue to do things like go out in the woods and look at what's actually happening on the ground.